excited to welcome the team from Arab, from the Drup White Lotus School in, in Ladakh, um, uh, to give a kind of presentation on the project. Um, and then we'll have a kind of short Q&A at the end of the talk as well. Um, please feel free to drop any questions in that you have as the kind of talk is progressing. We'll kind of try and pick them up and use those to, to um, direct the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, it would also be great if everyone could kind of keep, stay muted and keep their screens off while the, the presentation is underway. Um, before I introduce our kind of main speakers for the day, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to um, Article 25 to con con contextualize this talk series. Um, First off, my name's Toby Peer. I'm one of the, the architects with Article 25 and um, been involved in this Make Design Matters series over the last couple of years. We like to give a platform to, to other organizations doing work along similar lines to our own. Um, so for those of you who are kind of new to Article 25, it's worth just kind of giving you a brief intro. So the name Article 25 is, is derived from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which guides much of the work that we do. Um, within that declaration, uh, that there's a kind of sentence which states that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and the well-being of themselves and their family. And this pertains to kind of food, clothing, housing, medical care. Um, and much of our project work um, is directed towards these things, particularly medical care, um, education, housing. Um, so Article 25's vision is... is um, a broad one, um, but we refer back to it in all, in, in all of our projects. So we, we look to kind of the future where we have a world where all communities have access to better housing and safer school buildings and effective clinics and hospitals. Um, to do so, we work with other organizations doing great things around the world, um, running hospitals, clinics, schools, colleges, um, and we help them to kind of design more robust buildings, um, more environmentally friendly buildings and ones that kind of really add resilience to the communities we're working with. Um, everything we do is kind of underpinned by the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which many of you may be familiar with, um, particularly those, um, as I've said before, that kind of link to healthcare and education and, and sustainable communities. So numbers three, four, 11, you can see there. And, and in this, um, this kind of uh, um, aim, we've, we've now kind of amassed a vast range of experience over the past kind of 15 years or so. We've, we've run kind of near 100 projects that span kind of over 36 countries, and we're kind of um, expanding that network year on year. So um, I'm now going to kind of hand over to the team at Arup, and uh, they can focus on the kind of the, the, the really important thing for this evening. So um, they're going to talk about a project which has been going on for many years. And it's one that I'm personally really, really excited to hear a little bit more about. I was lucky enough to visit the school back in kind of 2011, 2012, um, on a number of occasions. It was a really real inspiration and took some work that I was involved with in the region. Um, so uh, let me introduce to you kind of Sean McIntosh. Um, who is the architect at Arab, who's been involved in this project right from the early days. Um, and also his colleague, Sebastian Kaminsky, who's structural engineer with Arab and has been working on um, the scheme in recent years as well. So without further ado, let me, let me hand over to you both, uh, Sean and Sebastian. Um, and I'm gonna sh stop sharing my screen and, and let you take over. Thank you very much. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so here we are, the Trick White Lotus School in Ladakh, Northern India. And for those who don't know, Ladakh is right there to the north. Um, above the, uh, the, the, I have the Himalayan Plateau. So you have the uh, Indus Valley, which is um, actually what gives India its name, the Indus River Indus, and our client, who is the Gyawang Drukpa 
uh, who has a vision for the school. And really the uh, origins of this are that um, the education system in India hasn't really met the needs of the local Ladakhi people. And they haven't been really uh, attaining great things. And that's because it doesn't tend to really be um, very culturally specific. So um, His Holiness recognized this fact and wanted to create a school which would um, really help to keep the culture of the uh, Buddhist community, not, not purely the Buddhist community, but that um, is one, one focus. And language is also very key. So the school um, teaches in Hindi and English, but also in the local Bodhi language. And um, Annie is here from the Trust and can talk more about this, but um, it's also uh, really helps to um, engender and keep the traditions in uh, um, many ways in terms of music and, and many other traditions. So, sorry to interrupt, Sean. Could you try to share your screen again? Because we, we can't see it at present. Ah, okay, sorry, let's start again. <laughs> no worries. Ah. Okay, there we go. Ah, okay, here we are. So there is Ladakh, and here we have uh, the His Holiness, the Gyawang Drukpa. So, um, who envisaged this uh, comprehensive modern education, which is combined with the traditional cultures and value systems um, for a new generation of Ladakhi children. And, and there we are, we have the, the Indus Valley. So it's a high altitude plateau, very um, great extremes of uh, temperature um, with very little in terms of um, cloud cover or, or rain, although that has been changing partially due to climate change. And where the Indus floods, you have a very um, fertile soil. So you can see there, top right picture, um, the, the extremes there. And the bottom right is um, a, a, an image of one of the monasteries. So you have this very strong uh, Buddhist culture there, which um, is, is very much focused on the, the land and the people and the buildings really feel very much of their place. This is Hemis, which is actually where um, His Holiness is resident. And this is the um, Hemis festival. And you can see the um, vernacular building technologies there. They have a base, typically a base of stone and then mud brick walls, which are reinforced with timber and um, these uh, openings, these balconies and decorated uh, eaves with uh, earth roofs. And typically you also have top lights coming in to uh, the temple buildings. And the buildings tend to be uh, organized around courtyards as well. So in terms of our brief, um, the, the village of Shea uh, donated this land to, um, for the purpose of the school. And um, His Holiness gave us the brief, a most extraordinary brief to uh, configure the, the school around a mandala as a device. So the mandala is uh, a figure which is used both in Hindu and Buddhist traditions. And in the Buddhist tradition, it's used um, as a focus for meditation. So you have a nine grid square. And in our case, we were interpreting this, um, this mandala and we have uh, orientated it so that it is 
uh, facing the daytime um, buildings to the south, but um, slightly favoring the, the rising sun. And, and that is for environmental um, reasons. And so you, you circulate through this mandala and it's, it's not necessarily, um, it's something that you discover rather than being um, very uh, clearly uh, defined. Um, then to the north, there is a, a residential spine. So we have um, basically uh, half of the school is with the daytime pupils and half of the school is with uh, residential pupils because the uh, people in Ladakh, we have many remote villages and these um, children wouldn't have a formal education without, if it weren't for this school. So they come to the school and uh, reside there. We can see uh, the road to the south, which is um, the, the entrance uh, to the, the school complex off that road. And then further to the south of that is the irrigated land. And further to the south of that again is the River Indus. So there we have um, an aerial shot. And uh, to the left there, you can see the promontory of rock there. And above there is the the palace of uh, Shea, which was originally where the king resided. And then you can see again that road to the south and the irrigated fields. And then you can hopefully make out the, the figure of the, the mandala with uh, the central courtyard, and it's, um, which, is, which is circular, uh, which relates to um, uh, the Dharma wheel. And then uh, off that, you have the residential spine. And to the north of that, again, there is a temple complex, which is the Naropa. This is uh, an image of a photo of the uh, first courtyard when it was opened in 2001. Um, and you can see there that the, the materials that we chose were really governed principally by concerns of trying to minimize our, our footprint, to try to um, tread lightly in Ladakh, as well as create a, a complex which was going to stand the test of time. So we, we chose uh, granite uh, for the, the walls and we would really wanted to marry uh, and have a marriage between uh, construction techniques which uh, borrowed from the, the local vernacular, but also overlay that with modern engineering so that the buildings performed um, much better than the, the local buildings you know, that they were light, um, filled with light and warm and and met all the right uh, space standards and coming to um and the the, uh, the game we also wanted to organize the buildings around courtyards very much like the monasteries that you see elsewhere in the, the dam so you can see the the timber use of timber and the um glazed walls facing predominantly south and this is in order that the buildings benefit from solar gain. So here we have the plan of the uh, nursery and infant school organized around a courtyard. So the central section there is all external and the buildings are entered via lobbies and the structure of the buildings are um, with a timber frame and we have masonry walls with a uh, inner leaf of mud brick and an outer leaf of granite uh, to the north, east and west, and then glazed uh, timber screens to the south or south-south-east. 
the the lobbies are uh, an area for storing your shoes, but also they provide an airlock. And then uh, to the south of the buildings, you have a also a planter, typically. And you can see uh, to the left there, we have uh, toilets, which we'll talk about a bit in more detail. So um, really, the, the concept behind the buildings was that they should be self-sufficient uh, so that uh, there's no, where we can, there's uh, no additional requirements. So there's, for instance, no uh, mechanical ventilation. Everything is passively ventilated and also uh, passively heated. So in the winter months, um, Generally speaking, you keep the windows closed, although you um, will need to exhaust, clean um, out the stale air at the end of the day. We're not particularly concerned about the performance of the buildings um, from a heating perspective during the night for these daytime buildings. And in the summertime, the, um, the windows can be opened. So for, these, for this uh, northern block for the nursery, we have quite a deep plan and um, the, uh, we have this butterfly roof. So we have a relatively flat roof, which uses earth with a, the membrane is actually a layer of clay. And then the butterfly roof is formed with uh, metal and um, insulation. And so the, largely speaking, the materials are all found locally. We have poplar joists. The, the uh, element which is uh, imported from Kashmir, I mean, it's um, still within in India, is the, the timber frame. And here we can see some photographs of the, the construction with the, the local people. And there was um, expertise as well from coming from Kashmir, particularly in relation to the, the carpenters and uh, the masons, uh, typically um, Nepalese. And then we have um, the nursery and infant school under construction. You can see the timber frame there and the central gutter to the butterfly roof. And in the distance, you can see um, some stupas there, which are, uh, are there to remember the dead. And we always have the backdrop of the, the Himalayas. So as well as the construction process, the outcome being the buildings themselves. The, the construction also enables the, um, the techniques, the traditional techniques to be kept alive through the process. And the school has um, grown gradually as the needs arise, one courtyard at a time. So then in relation to the residences, obviously for the residences, there are certain differences. We uh, do not need to have the same spans. So we were able to look at uh, smaller timber section sizes and a different kind of arrangement. Um, but also importantly, environmentally, we're interested in a certain amount of daylight coming in and air but also the uh, passive heating of the buildings during the night as well as the daytime. So for those reasons, we adopted a, a trom wall design for the, uh, the southern facades. So that's uh, an image, it's some photos of the finished nursery school. And here are some of the finished residences. And you can see there on the top left that uh, there is also a window providing daylight and, and air 
um, central to each uh, dormitory class um, room with um, shutters that can be closed. And then there are vents within the trum wall which en enable the warmed air within the cavity between the outer glass screen and the inner mud brick wall to um, the air to come through into this space. So there we have uh, for the residences, the, the diagram there for the winter, bringing the warm air into the dormitory spaces. And that's both radiated through from the um, mud brick wall and through these vents. And then in the summertime, you're able to flush out that air through the opening windows uh, to the front and back. And so we can see here with the, these graphs, um, the very steep oscillation between um, the temperatures between night and day. And with the, the daytime buildings, that um, is significantly improved during the, the daylight hours. But for the residences, we have a much more flattened um, curvature that you can see there in yellow. Uh, for the, for the, the toilets, um, once again, we're looking at passive techniques. So uh, water is of a premium and um, we would therefore only use water uh, for the washing of hands and irrigation purposes and, and obviously the kitchen. But not there isn't any um, use in terms of the, the toilets themselves. So the we have dry latrines, and we took um, the local design for the dry latrine and improved upon that. One in one way by introducing a water trough inside the building, so that you could wash your hands uh, more more. Uh, easily, and by introducing a a stack vent, which um, encourages the drying out of the material and the composting process, and we see there the that has a there's a fly mesh um, right at the top of that vent, and you have a, a black painted metal cladding to. Uh, speed up the heating process and draw that stack effect. And very importantly, um, you have to keep this compost process dry. Um, and one of the interesting things about this whole process is it's very much been a work of collaboration. So initially, we didn't get the design right. And we, we put in a, a concrete slab um, throughout um, and what was happening was that we'd actually departed too far away from the local design and um, the cleaning staff were washing down the concrete and of course that was coming through into uh, the pits below and so what we then looked at, at doing was um, how, introducing a mud floor um, which is much more culturally the norm and uh, and teaching the staff and pupils that they should use it um, as, as they do locally uh, completely dry and and just brush any material down and so those problems were went away and so the material is a there's a cycle where you have two holes per cubicle so one is in use and one is out of use, and they, they relate to different pits below. So you, it allows that composting process to happen. And then the material is used um, on trees, not, no foodstuffs. Um, in terms of the water supply, we didn't want to tap off from the Indus because that is a, um, a resource that's 
that, that, that is there really specifically for irrigation um, and uh, for the fields. So we actually um, have put in a series of boreholes and those draw the water up to storage tanks via um, with the use of uh, PV panels as a source of power. And, and there we have uh, bottom rights, Angdu, our construction manager, right from the beginning, who has been uh, our design collaborator and advisor and everything. We couldn't have done it without Angdu and his very many uh, experts as well. In terms of the electrical supply, there is now a, a, a dam um, which provides renewable power um, in the region, but it, is, um, it isn't terribly resilient. So we, we also have uh, PV panels um, which feed into a battery system and they allow for um, dual use as well because they provide some shade to these daytime buildings from the high level sun. So um, we were moving ahead with a great plan and things were going very well and until 2010. And there was um, a cloudburst, a very unusual event, which we're discovering is becoming more frequent now with um, climate change. And this event caused the devastation of uh, many buildings in Ladakh, in, including in Leh, and a lot of loss of life. And so, for instance, the neighbouring sites, the, the buildings were flattened. The, uh, the rainfall, the sudden rainfall, which was a, like a month's rainfall or in one night, uh, caused a mudslide, um, which came through the campus in the middle of the night and the children had to be evacuated to a high place. And the buildings, uh, no, there was no loss of life at the school and that the buildings stood up, that you can see the devastation that was caused where the, uh, the, the ground level completely changed. The, the mud was inundated um, some of the classrooms and residences. Um, and so a clear up then needed to take place with the buildings being renovated and also a wall was built using again um, local techniques using a stone wall and uh, a berm and, and a trench which has to be regularly maintained to um, mitigate against any future mudslide. And you can see from the aerial shot there, the extent of that wall. And there it is um, under construction, a beautiful piece of infrastructure. However, there was some unforeseen um, uh, aspect to that, and I'm gonna pass on to Seb now. Hi everyone, I'm going to talk through the second part of the presentation. Um, so as Sean's described, the, the background of the, of the school and the subsequent um, mudslide, and this led to unfortunately some timber rot being discovered. You can see this is just an example of some of the rot. Um, some of the timber above ground basically had completely um, rotten, So, and this happened in a number of the buildings, so obviously we had to do something about that. Um, we had to obviously repair the rot and try and make it more, um, more resilient for the future. At the same time, um, when we started, when we discovered the rot, um, we, we, we realised as, as, as an increased understanding of the seismic hazard in the region. So Indian codes now say that the seismic hazard, the earthquake hazard is two and a half times greater than we had previously believed. And international studies suggest it's actually greater still than the Indian codes. You can see where we are 
We're very much in the Himalayas, the blue arrow points out where we are. So we're in a very high risk zone. Um, so this meant that the buildings were um, more vulnerable to earthquakes than we had uh, previously anticipated. And therefore we wanted to make them safer. So in terms of the seismic upgrade and the, the, the rock uh, repair, um, so the, we had a plan of what to do for this. So firstly, we wanted to lighten buildings whenever um, possible. This is really important because in an earthquake, the force that you have to resist, the force that a building experiences in, in an earthquake is directly proportional to the weight of it. So it's good to have light buildings. So the aim here is where we could, we would try and lighten the buildings that reduces their earthquake vulnerability. The existing bracing, bracing systems, we wanted to strengthen to make them stronger against earthquakes. And where possible, we wanted to incorporate um, the ability to absorb energy into the bracing system. That's standard earthquake design. We wanted to tie the building and the wall together and that helps to, to share the load in an earthquake better. And we wanted to replace the rotten timber, isolate it fully from the ground and make it more resilient um, for the future in case there were further mudslides. This is an example of one of the residences during um, the seismic upgrade work. And inside you can see we had to remove a lot of the timber, um, especially the columns and the sole plate, which in many cases had rotten. Um, what we've done, we have a, a strengthened foundation, a new timber column structure, uh, the, the roof stayed in place. Um, you can see we've also had to strengthen the existing walls. The existing walls are stone. And we've done that on this photo, you can see by um, casting a reinforced concrete frame against the wall to grab hold of it. We've tied that concrete frame back to the building to tie everything together. And on one elevation, we have the trum wall, which um, Sean talked about before. And we had to keep that, we couldn't hide it over. It's very important for basically the thermal performance of the building, which is essential. So we put some steel bracing on that elevation. This is unfinished, of course. And this is one of the residences before on the left and after retrofit. So you can see we've tried to keep the same, um, the same aesthetic. Um, the, fact the, photo, the fact that it looks dark is purely just when it's taken during the day. Um, Actually, the, the visuals end up looking very, very similar, but the buildings are a lot stronger against earthquakes now. The bracing you can see is still unfinished. That's an unfinished piece that we, we're going to, to add on. And this is from the outside um, after it's been um, seismically upgraded. And you can see that the changes are visually, they look quite minimal. And so we've tried to keep that, uh, that original aesthetic. This is again after retrofit, looks very, very similar, but it's much stronger. So that's for the retrofit. Now, at the same time, we wanted to start building new buildings, especially um, shower blocks, um, because they, we had some in the residences, but we wanted to make the use most out of the residences and create our own shower block. We're also thinking for the future, just also thinking about new classrooms, um, so we wanted to develop a new building strategy, but one which incorporates the higher seismic risk that we now understand the, the, the zone to have. So our strategy for this was actually very similar to before, but the priorities may have shifted a bit because now we know seismic hazard is so important. So in general, and this really applies for any developed world context, the most important thing is holistically, the design has to be appropriate for the context. That's taken into account many different characteristics. We can't um, we can't really lose one or two. They've all got to be taken into consideration to have something that truly works. Um, it's got to achieve its function, of course. That's, that's its basic design. It's got to be seismically resistant. We know that this is a very seismic area, as seismic as San Francisco, as, se as seismic as Japan. So it has to be safe. It needs to be simple to construct using semi-skilled labor. This is very, very important in these contexts. Uh, we have got good labor, um, but um, even if we're using quite simple techniques for seismic resistance, um, it still needs to be simple to construct. If we start to introduce complicated details, this is when things go wrong. 
Um, it's got to be durable and low maintenance. So it wants to have a proper good design life. We're talking sort of 50, 60 years with, with little maintenance. It's got to be affordable, of course. It's got to be culturally acceptable um, and general appropriate for the community all around. We want to use local materials as much as possible for the environmental benefits um, and also for, for, you, for maximizing the use of the local economy. And thermal performance is essential as well. And low carbon, I put it at the bottom, but actually it's still incredibly important. This, this isn't this order, isn't the order which these um, elements are applied. This is just a, a general list. And aesthetically pleasing is also important um, for this particular context. So this is the shower building that we developed. We've used the same sort of materials and technologies that we've used before, um, but we've made them more, more seismically resistant. So we have a, a stone wall that mimics the, the stone walls that were used, used in the other buildings. That's now been reinforced with steel to make it a lot stronger. We have a trom wall on the front, which gives thermal performance, good thermal performance to the building. We've gone with a, a concrete roof in this case because it's got a, a superior seismic performance. We've made it as thin as possible. And a timber clad water tank on the, on, um, and uh, you can see the solar heater as well to provide some hot water. And this is the, um, the shower block under construction. And nearly finished. And that's sort of the inside. That's the trom wall. So we have timbers embedded in that trom wall, and that's again to stop the trom wall falling in a, in the event of an earthquake. And it's finished on the right hand side. And that's the finished shower block. So similar aesthetic to the other buildings, but um, very resilient to earthquakes now as well. And maximising the use of those local materials. We've also seismically retrofitted one of the two-storey buildings, which is the junior school north. In this case, there was a two-storey uh, masonry wall around the perimeter. Because of the high seismic risk, it was decided to take that down and replace it with a much lighter structure. And that's all timber on the upper storey now. We've clad that in, in local timber um, and it's got a, um, a light roof with, a, um, met with metal sheeting and insulation below that and to provide good thermal performance. Even though that timber is exposed, um, and in most contexts, that timber wouldn't last very long. Um, in this particular case, it's actually a very dry environment and we have good drip details, and we've used a moderately durable timber. So involving our timber specialists, we expect this to last quite comfortably 30, 40 years at least, as any facade might be. So there, there may be some maintenance required. We've also used this new opportunity working with the school to try and improve health and safety on site as much as possible. Um, so we've, we've provided um, um, PPE to all, the, to all the workers on site and we've tried to communicate the benefits of that as much as we can. Um, on the left hand side, you can see the, the, um, the, the, lead, the, lead, um, the lead engineering manager, Angus, wearing PPE. Um, we've got two REs out there from um, from our, the local community. You can see that the one of the the masons there. They they did use some of the PP, but they haven't used as much as we would have liked. But over time, that's improving. It's not something that's going to change over overnight. But we are encouraging them. We're providing free PP. We're explaining why it's required, and we're st starting to see a bit of an uptake. So to summarise some key messages. For, um, for working in humanitarian and development contexts in, high, in highly seismic areas that we've learned from this project and other projects. Um, and the most important one is using teams with wide ranging skill sets. Most successful projects use combine architects with engineers, sociologists, um, a strong client um, and specialists in things like mechanical and electrical and ventilation and so forth. It's really important to use community knowledge in terms of materials and technologies and what's typically what can be made locally. It's important to be aware of um, some common misconceptions, especially regarding natural and sustainable materials. We see this quite a lot, especially 
using materials like timber and bamboo. Um, a lot of these materials have a lot of benefits, but sometimes they can be slightly exaggerated. And they're not always used appropriately and there can be issues with durability. So just a, a watch it there. Um, although natural materials are excellent, we would encourage them not to be forced when they're not appropriate or won't be accepted. In some cases, um, other materials such as concrete, even despite, despite the fact it is high carbon, in some cases it is more appropriate or more appropriate for some elements of the structure. There isn't one right answer. Definitely avoid, avoid bringing in alien materials and technologies. These rarely work. It's best to use local, um, local techniques, local materials, and what's available in the local market. Consider working with an improving traditional vernacular technologies. This can be very, very effective. These ven traditional vernacular technologies, they've, they've been designed to work with the local community, local materials, um, and the local climate. They've been developed through trial and error over thousands of years. They are very effective. Often small improvements to them can, using modern engineering, can actually improve them significantly, yet maintaining that local, um, that local knowledge and that local, those local materials and technologies. So that's definitely something we'd recommend. And finally, there isn't one, one size fits all solution for all contexts. Each context will have a very specific solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. And um, thank you, Sean. That was really, really fascinating. I've got plenty of things to say, many thoughts, but I'm going to resist those for now and introduce Annie Smith. Um, so Annie is a trustee of the Drup White Lotus School. And um, Annie, are you there? I am, thank you. Yeah, I'm just trying to unmute and start the video. Fantastic. There we go. That's it. Good. So Annie has been involved with the school since its inception um, and her history and kind of education and development fields has kind of made her well suited. Um, she's a veteran of Ladakh as well, has a deep love for the place. Um, and I'm going to hand over to her now um, for a quick and presentation on, on, on the school itself. Annie. Thank you, Toby. Right. Okay. okay, so good evening. Um, I'm hoping that uh, I'd like to just this evening provide the background story to the presentation that Sean and Seb have just given and talk about some of the impacts the school has had on the lives of those who use it um, and the wider community. Drukwai Lotus School is, um, just to point out, Drukwai Lotus School is actually known as Druk Pema Kapo School in Ladakhi. That's the Ladakhi name for it. So if you hear me referring to it as Druk Pema Kapo School or calling it DPKS for short, then, then you understand that's what I'm referring to. So in the early 1990s, Ladakhi people, um, including those from remote communities, were asking His Holiness, as, as Sean was earlier saying, the Gaumon Drukpa is his official name. Um, he's head of the Drukpa lineage of Buddhism. So they were asking him to please take their children into the monasteries. However, the Gaumon Drukpa could see that young people required a broader education, one that would be equipping them for life and employment in a rapidly changing society. So his vision was to create an inspiring school designed around the sacred, sacred geometry of the Dharma wheel and the nine square mandala. The school for both girls and boys was to be rooted in culture and traditions of Ladakh, providing students with modern academic subjects delivered in a way that would encourage knowledge and life skills to help face the challenges of a changing world with confidence and bring to young people an understanding of where they came from and what to value. He asked Drupa Trust in the UK to help and we soon partnered with Jonathan Rose and a team of architects and engineers from Arab. The project is a collaboration of knowledge and skills from two cultures, different in many ways, but both learning to work together to create something new, exciting and visionary. With the above understanding in mind, Drupa Trust set out to build a school which would provide a meaningful education starting at nursery, age three to four, up to class 10, age 16. The two form intake from year one. 
Residential accommodation was also required for the children from outside the immediate catchment area, as well as the more remote nomad communities. And I will explain a little bit more later about the need to support the community, uh, the nomad communities. So right now, the school currently has about 885 students, 456 are boys, um, 429 are girls, and nearly 230 of them live in the residential facilities. The academic subjects studied are English, Hindi, and Bodhi, but Bodhi's only studied to your aid, math, science, and social science. In addition, art, music, and sports are studied along with dance, drama, and debating forming part of extracurricular activities. So why a need for, for quality education? Well, as client Dripper Trust began preparing the brief for the school by researching existing school facilities within the Ley region, at this time, there were a couple of non-for-profit um, private schools, but most schools were provided by the government. In terms of quantity, the provision of schools was good, but the facilities were often poor. Constructed at best with concrete frames and mud brick infill, the rooms were very small with low levels of natural light and children sitting on mud or concrete floors with just a small piece of carpet to keep out the cold. Often toilet facilities were inadequate or even non-existent. The classroom teaching was from the front with the talk and chalk method where facts were memorized and then regurgitated to answer exam questions. Children were not encouraged to bring their own experiences and imagination to the learning process. In addition, teachers working at schools in remote regions, such as the nomad communities, came from other areas of Ladakh because there are no locally qualified teachers. After a short time, many became homesick and would leave their posts resulting in the children turning up for school, but no one there to teach them. Hence DPKS's policy to take some nomad children into the residences. So in the 1990s, quality education, uh, so in the 1990s, quality education provided in an environment conducive to learning was not readily available in Ladakh. Drupal Trust wanted to create a school that was environmentally conscious, and where possible incorporated natural renewable sources of building materials. The classrooms needed to be light, spacious, and given the extremes of climate, a comfortable temperature throughout the day and the year. The importance of this was not only to create a more pleasant environment to study in, but also to encourage a wider range of teaching methodologies. Larger flexible spaces enabled DPKS to move away from the teacher-led system of memorization and regurgitation of facts, and to introduce child-centered learning by doing practices, such as role play, group work, or running a range of different activities at the same time. Teacher training has, and still is provided by DPKS to help develop and embed these new methodologies. The brief of the school also required residential facilities. Here we wanted to create a family feel with children grouped together in smaller single sex units of mixed ages so that older children could help younger children along with the house parents. At DPS, we have eight students to a small dormitory room and five dormitory rooms to a block with a communal area. The residences are on the scale of a Ladakhi family house and the spaces are warm, cozy and homely due to the use of passive solar gain and natural familiar and natural familiar materials, um, as the images you saw earlier have shown you. Many of our residential students uh, are also sponsored under an international sponsorship scheme. So I think here is a good time to talk about safety and that children must have a safe and healthy environment to learn in. And as clients, we were aware of the threat of seismic activity. So this consideration had been in the brief from the outset of the project. To my knowledge, seismic activity is not widely considered in the construction of new buildings in Ladakh. So our buildings are quite unique in this respect. DPGS students are trained in earthquake drill and know how to protect themselves in the event of a significant tremor. As Sean and Seb have already explained, the performance level of the high risk area of the school is currently being upgraded to meet the increased seismic code. However, one thing that was unexpected was the ferocity of the cloudburst of 2010 and the immense damage it caused across a large section of the lay area. Due to the earlier seismic considerations, the school was robust enough to take the hit, 
and remained standing, unlike many buildings in the area. Consequently, DPKS was able to accommodate 60 additional children in the residences. These were children who had either lost homes, schools, or in some cases, their parents as well. So in the event of future extreme climate events or an earthquake, it is, envisi sorry, it is envisaged that our school buildings will be a safe center providing refuge for local villagers and or children from other schools. At the moment, the repair and upgrade work is or has been causing a degree of disruption at the school, so I've had to find different classrooms to work in. But fortunately, we do have the space and some of the residents are closed to uh, reducing the number of available dormitories. Though of course, COVID has closed the school for the last year and except for exam classes, students receive online teaching at home. The upgrade and repair work has also had an impact on Drip Trust fundraising Costs have to be covered, and these are unfortunately unattractive to donors, so difficult to raise. And consequently, it is slowing our progress on fundraising for new build. Anyway, let's look at the present day and local impact. So the buildings on the DPKS campus are an excellent example of how to use local renewable materials and skills of construction, which integrate the DACI building styles and values of working closely with the environment along with the very latest modern engineering. They demonstrate that modern doesn't have to be synonymous with reinforced concrete. The beauty of natural materials and harnessing renewable energy can be incorporated into a building that provides space, light, warmth, and safety. This is something our students and staff and visitors take away with them. And we believe is sowing the seed of appropriate design for the future. Overall, I would say that key to success in any cross-cultural project such as this is good communication. Listening, learning, and responding appropriately is necessary on both sides. In the early years, there was no local team to work with, but slowly this changed, and by 1998, the Drukpa Makapo Education Society was established with an active school committee, and an excellent site manager was appointed Sona Mangdu, who is still with us today, as Sean and Seb have told us. So we have learned so much from Mangdu and he from us. And on site, he anchors everything, running a fantastic team of laborers. On the school operations side, we have a very positive relationship with the principal, Mingyua Angmo, and also her staff, several of them of whom were at the school when it opened 20 years ago. Mingyu is young and vivacious Ladaki and strong and passionate about education. Members of Drupal Trust visit yearly to discuss various matters, and once the business side is over, we always take the opportunity to have a great time with the kids. We go on picnics, outings, play games with them, and generally have a great time. So the school opened in 2001 with just 88 children in the nursery and kindergarten. Over the last 20 years, the school has evolved and developed, and DPKS now has an excellent reputation. It is oversubscribed, and is in the top three schools in the area for exam results. Last year, there, were there was a 100% pass rate, and out of 64 students taking the matriculation exams, 53 passed with a distinction. Approximately 370 students have now matriculated, and many go on to further education. The school produces well-rounded and confident young people who value and appreciate the school and the opportunities education has brought them. It was good to hear recently that many of the alumni come back to work as volunteers at the school for one or two months during their vacation. They volunteer as primary teachers or in art, sports and dance, etc. So what about the future? One of the project's aims is to ensure that there is not a brain drain from the region and Ladakh's young talent return to Ladakh. At the moment, sectors of education are missing. Good, sorry, <clears throat> good provision for year 16 to, eight, for 16 to 18 year olds, i.e. higher secondary, is on the rise in Ladakh. But degree provision is very limited. The next phase of DPKS is to build for years 11 and 12, the higher secondary. And the subjects our school will teach are commerce and humanities. There is also talk of the school expanding to a three class intake. Now that Ladakh has union ter territory status, the school no longer has to follow the JNK Board of Secondary Education. 
Instead, it will affiliate with the Central Board of Secondary Education, a respected exam board that is popular throughout India and considered favorable by top universities. The Union Cabinet has approved plans to build a new university in Ladakh. This will give many students the option to remain in Ladakh for degree level study, as our students currently need to go to other areas of India for their degrees. However, Drukpa Trust's sister charity, Live to Love International, has helped initiate and support a postgraduate program in Ladakh. It's called the Naropa Fellowship. This is a one year postgraduate program focused on creating and nurturing agents of change who will work towards fostering an ecosystem of entrepreneurship and growth while preserving the cultural heritage of Ladakh and the Himalayan region. The fellowship accepts students from across India and is popular among students from the Himalayas and those interested in development in the area. DPKS alumni returning to Ladakh after their degrees are also opting for this fellowship. So in summary, we believe that quality education should be provided in a quality environment that is conducive to learning and study. The evolution and growing success of DPKS over the last 20 years is testimony to this. Drupa Trust and DPKS is indebted to the team of architects and engineers at Arup who have over the last 27 years brought their time, expertise and passion to the project. It is a strong collaboration across thousands of miles and overall outcome despite challenges and some setbacks is outstanding. I would like to conclude with these words from one of our alumni, Yang Zin Chuskit. She says, I spent 13 years at this amazing school. It gave me not just knowledge, but also taught me values and discipline, how to be a kind and good person. The school gave me a great foundation and I went on to win a scholarship from the ASIM Foundation and enrolled on an electronic engineering course in Pune. I would like to thank my Drup Padmakarpis school family. And my message to the students is, love and appreciate your teachers and classmates because one day you will miss them. Yangzen always dreamed of becoming an entrepreneur and wanted to help in shaping Ladakh and set an example to others. Yangzen's dream has come true and she now has a, smart, a small startup IT firm in Ladakh designing websites and looking to expand into school management systems. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Um, really, really interesting. It's such a lovely note to finish on as well. The kind of story of a, a student coming through full circle, really um, wonderful. Um, so um, I'd just like to thank both Annie and Sean and Sebastian once again for a really fascinating pair of, of presentations. And it's actually quite unusual for us on these talks to get the kind of the client side presentation as well, and uh, but really, really valuable as a, a follow up to the kind of more technical architectural engineering side, which we <laughs> which we always go for. Um, so we now we've overrun a little bit, but I think we can probably allow ourselves 10 to 15 minutes for, for a little kind of Q&A discussion. Um, so if um, um, I can ask you all to rejoin me, I'm also going to introduce our final um, panel member, Kamal Chavla, um, an architect from um, Delhi, who um, I've had the pleasure of working with in the past. Um, Kamal has been part of an in Indian NGO called Seeds for, for the past kind of 10, 11 years, um, focused on kind of reconstruction projects across India um, in its vast array of, of contexts and climates. Uh, he's also got experience of Ladakh itself from um, a reconstruction project in the wake of the flash floods that um, Sean and Sebastian spoke about. So um, to get our little round table discussion started, I might actually hand over to you, Kamal, and, and ask you to kick us off with any um, comments or queries you have for, for any of the team. Thanks, Toby, um, and thanks, Annie, for sharing the idea behind the Padma Kapo School. And uh, thanks, Sean and Sebastian, for our lovely presentation. It really is an inspiring work. Um, I have worked in Ladakh um, 
after the floods in 2010 uh, i spent 3 years there and uh, seen the architecture around the region both the vernacular and the contemporary ones and i can say that uh, drug padma karpo school is an exemplar of contemporary vernacular architecture in ladakh and it has been inspiration uh, uh, behind many architectural interventions in the region since the completion of its phase 1 and uh, yeah so um, i can kick off with uh, uh, with couple of questions uh, you mentioned about um, use of local materials uh, such as stone and timber and also uh, use of community knowledge in your design so uh, were you able to engage with the local community during the design process or during the construction process and if so how Is is that a question for? Shall I go for first? <laughs> um, so yeah, it, well, it has been a a, a um, an iterative process. Uh, that that's for sure. So um, I mean, initially, um, uh, Jonathan Rose and uh, a colleague uh, Duncan Woodburn went, went out to to Ladakh and and uh, really researched. Um, the the local architecture and uh later Jim Fleming a uh, structural engineer at the time um also went out and the the dialogue has been between us and the Drup Trust based in London but also with his holiness the Gawain Drup so right from the beginning the our um our philosophy and the green approach was to look at the, the uh really um how we could take some of the local knowledge and materials and uh reuse those in in a way which um uh, was both culturally specific but also met uh, excellent performance criteria so whilst we you know uh were responding to local thinking we were also um doing so in a sort of dynamic way so for instance with the, the use of granite um granite isn't always used in in quite so um extensively in buildings in Ladakh you do find it on the mani walls which are very wonderful and uh at a low level but our um sort of reinterpretation of the vernacular here was partially to look at um how the buildings would last over time so um of course once the uh the built the first courtyard opened and and the certain elements of that which were directly came from our collaboration with um Angdu the construction manager for instance the eaves detail which is a a very uh, culturally specific detail and the actual build up of the mud mud roof the earth roof that, that's something we learned from Angdu because um it's a very specific uh, build up um so both technically and aesthetically it's it, we're, it's a learning process but then of course once the school existed uh we were then getting feedback as well from uh the head teachers and and um the uh the, the staff who were managing the residences so uh for instance in relation to how the classrooms could be organized in the future uh with one of the buildings we had uh, initially the use of um some bracing which um limited the way in which the classrooms could be used and that was considered by the head teacher at the time to be um not not the best thing to do from a um pedagogic way uh, uh it, it limited the the flexibility so we reflected on that uh and adjusted uh, accordingly and i also mentioned about the the toilets as well so it has been you know a constantly learning process um a, a conversation which literally happens 
Well, in, in, in Seb's case, um, recently, you know, um, more than once a week, uh, often um, every day, actually, with, with Angu, but engaging with um, on a regular basis. Right, yeah. Yeah, actually, um, when one works in such remote areas, you can learn only by directly communicating with the community because there is no literature available uh, for one to study. So yeah, it's actually a, a great learning experience uh, working uh, in such remote areas uh, and with such communities, yeah. Uh, my next question is for um, Annie. Annie, you mentioned that um, you have envisaged this, uh, this school, not just as an educational facility, but it uh, can also be used as a rescue shelter in case of any emergency. Um, so are you also envisaging it uh, as, a, as a place for uh, cultural activities? Because it is a large campus. There are a lot of open as well as indoor areas. And uh, in a place like Ladakh, in Buddhist culture, they uh, they have a practice of uh, of uh, of festivals, so and other cultural activities. So, do you also envisage it as a cultural hub uh, for the region? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely, Kamal. Um, you know, the the culture, the dances, the drama. It is such an important part of Ladakhi society. And the school is regularly, anyway, um, performing and holding performances. But you know, alongside the festivals that are run, those are celebrated, those are recognized. They are used as learning opportunities as well amongst the students. And the parents, the local villages of Shea, uh, actually, you know, are very involved uh, with all of these activities and support them. I think a few years back, it was in 2004, you probably heard of the Naropa ceremony, and this was actually held at the school site. So we were using the facilities there, um, the space for camping. We also have further up what is called the Naropa Potang, which um, is a sort of a, a sort of religious building, a um, um, temple type building, um, and we were using that as well. So it's it's got the potential, as you say, it's an enormous site, so it's got a potential to be used for a lot of different things. And I think once also we have completed the uh, buildings, which also involve a multi-purpose hall and some larger spaces like that, that this will also open up further opportunities to use it as a community space. We would like to see it used in that way. Yeah, that's great to know. So Toby, I think we can open it for the audience. And uh, I think there are already a few questions I can see in the chat box. So yeah, yeah over to you, Toby, for now. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kamal. Um, yeah, I'm just going to um, stay with Annie for the first question, perhaps this is from Nadine. And uh, just, just to kind of ask about the funding behind the project um, and whether the kind of funding um, was a factor in the decisions on the kind of architectural materiality side? Um, I think, you know, with the funding that, that uh, you know, it hasn't really, we haven't limited anything at all according to the funding. We've worked with our from the beginning and we understand the need to, to build this building as it is for all the reasons and the values that have been put forward today. So the fundraising actually is ongoing. Drupa Trust is responsible for that. And we started fundraising right back probably as early as, as 1992, 94. And it's an ongoing process. It's uh, something that we work at very hard. Um, I need to mention Rachel Glynn here, who actually is our only um, employee. And she uh, has been working with us for many years now, but she is the person who holds together the project in terms of coordination and administration, and a large part of her work is fundraising. We have to, you know, put out appeals and have a network of people like anybody else who's in a charity, and um, we apply for grant-making trusts. And one way or another, we've managed to get the funding in. It isn't always easy. We also have the sister charity that I mentioned earlier, which is an international charity called 
um, Live to Love. And again, you know, they try to do their best to help and support us, but they have a lot of uh, projects across the Himalayas. So it's an ongoing process. And uh, we're always looking for new donors if anybody's interested. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, okay, so we'll jump back towards, towards Sean on this one from Geneve, Genevieve Graham. Um, who enjoyed hearing the design story, both from the engineering and architectural and impact story perspectives. Um, and she'd like to know a bit more on the design process. So the upgrades in the new build strategy make intuitive sense, but what is the process internally for proof of concept and how is that coordinated with um, or approved by um, local governance? Um, maybe Sean, if you could have a go at uh, answering that. Certainly. Um, so we we have a we have a master plan which allows the the growth of the uh, the school over time. But within that master plan, there is um, flexibility in, in in detail, and that that has worked well for us. So the the master plan is absolutely key, so that the uh, the buildings aren't um, happening in a completely unplanned way but uh, in an organic way. Um, so the, there is uh, a number of levels to this. So we work with Annie and her, her colleagues at the Drupal Trust at uh, the detailed design of, of um, each of the classrooms and in terms of the retrofit once we realized that we had these uh, issues to deal with, of course, we had uh, work, design workshops with the Drip Trust. Um, and we also uh, uh, have, um, when we were starting out, of course, communication with uh, Ladakh was far more complicated. It was a question of putting through faxes and it was quite, it was quite tricky as well as obviously going out in person. But now it's much easier to, to communicate. So we were able to communicate with um, the, the heads of the school, uh, his eminence, who is another important figure um, uh, involved with the school and, and the governors of the school and uh, uh, get um, uh, a buy-in and, and also receive um, briefs from the school in terms of their own priorities. Um, so uh, we, we are looking now to expand the school as well for uh, further years um, uh, to have the sort of equivalent of A-levels. And um, so those, those needs are um, expressed in terms of uh, briefs to us, and, and feedback. So we're also very interested in not just hearing the positives, but also what things are not working so well uh, so that we can, we can improve on them. So um, it's a, a, a kind of circular process where we are constantly learning and, and improving. And the nature of our client um, is, is also uh, multi-headed. <laughs> this is often the way. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but which is a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, many thanks, Sean. Um, it's kind of quarter past seven, so I'm going to kind of make this the last question, but give um, um, both Sean and, and I think Kamal may, may have something to say about it as well. So it's fr from Anisha, who says it was it, it was inspiring to visit the school. Um, but I'm going to pick up on the first part of her question, which um, I'm also very intrigued by. So just how about the feasibility of this type of design cost and how maybe that compares with what would be the default um, school building in 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 Ladakh, um, in Ley, uh, and you know how that compares. But then you know, would it be feasible to roll this type of design out? And now, now this is a complex question. I'm aware of that, and and, and there are justifications for 
there are different ways to design schools as one-offs or as a model for the future, but it would just be interesting to hear a, a couple of words from, from you, Sean, and, and Kamal and Annie, if you'd like to, to, to kind of finish us off on that. On, on yeah, um, so for instance, on the, on the use of granite, you know, the granite was somewhat more expensive than the use of mud brick, and we, we compared those right at the early doors. Um, but we're also interested in not only the initial capital cost, but the, the long-term life costs of the, of the project. So um, where, where the, the philosophy which we've taken and which, which, we are, which is a common you know, theme with us and, and um, the Jukpa Trust is to look at the, the whole life costing and to look at solutions which work in, in the longer term. So the, yes, the school may be um, somewhat more expensive than um, some equivalents, but it's no more expensive than uh, governmental buildings in, in Ladakh. And, um, and, and we've seen, of course, that it withstood the, uh, withstood the mudslide. Um, so um, I think the, uh, the investment um, that we have made, that has collectively been made, has been well placed. Could, is this regarding Anisha's question? Yeah, yeah. Could I just add to that um, on the last part about the timber? So um, timber will only deteriorate if it's exposed to insect attack or, um, or, or it gets wet. Otherwise, it'll last forever. So in this case, we actually don't have termites. We don't have beetles, so we don't have an insect risk. So it doesn't need to be treated. And because the timber's basically been used uh, primarily internally, it stays dry. The timber that's outside is actually a dry enough environment for it to last, well, potentially 50, 60 years without any issues. So it's, it's, it's an unusual context where you don't have insects and it's particularly dry. And for that environment, timber can work quite well. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'll just offer up the opportunity first to Kamal for any final words. Don't feel you you needn't if. Uh... <laughs> yeah, um, as I said earlier, uh, this is an uh, inspiring project for uh, many of us. And I agree with uh, Sean, what he just mentioned uh, towards the end, that uh, uh, when we talk about uh, budgets or, or cost of the uh, project, so we don't need to consider only the uh, installation cost, but it is ultimately the long-term impact of the building. And for such regions, which are uh, climatically so fragile and also prone to uh, flash floods and earthquakes, so some sort of investment is required for any, any kind of public building. So yeah, uh, uh, so it's, I mean, um, I saw this project about uh, seven, eight years ago and it was still under construction. Part of it was built and part of it was under construction. So yeah, I mean, I still have that question. Is it like completely finished now or is it uh, uh, going on? It's, it's it's continuing. The work the work never ends. It's a, it's a, <laughs> I, I, I think um, yeah. I, I don't I don't see any retirement for me. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, we we still have the last phase to to complete, which is eleven. Um, you know, classes eleven and twelve. So that's an important part of the building, but. As Sean just said, and I mean, my experience working in schools is that there always being a need to upgrade, improve, build, expand. I don't think the work ever, ever stops. Fantastic. Well, that seems a, a, a really good point to, to end, end the evening. But um, it just sort of remains to say once again, thank you so much. Like for me, it's just a, a really wonderful example of a, a project with a visionary client and then a very... Um, such clarity in terms of its kind of um, passive design strategies. It's just marvelous to see it work. And then the data that you showed of those kind of 
uh, temperatures internally through the through the pattern of the day it just it's really really impressive and it's been an inspiration for me for many years so yes thank you so much sean um sebastian annie and kamal and thanks everyone else for joining us um we will be advertising kind of more make design matter talks before long and i hope you can kind of join us again <laughs>